Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to Movie House Concessions, the MHN Podcast Network's review of basically any film that we feel like reviewing. I'm Patrick. <laughs> uh, hello again. I'm Shane A. And this month we're reviewing 1973's Armacord, Federico Fellini's, one of Federico Fellini's most popular films. And I have the summary for this since I chose to review this film. Uh, we reviewed it for Criterion last year, so this is why we just threw it on the Movie House Concessions. We might as well talk about it, more things than just the disc itself. Armacord is a series of vignettes that capture life in a small seaside Italian town during the 1930s. The film takes place over one year and begins in the spring when the town celebrates the arrival of fluffy poplar seeds floating on the wind, symbolizing the end of winter. The town organizes a bonfire celebration which, dra- which draws everyone to the town square. The inhabitants of the town include the village beauty, Gradisca, her elder sister, the town idiot, Gedizio, the town nymphomaniac, Volpina, the blind accordion player, the buxom tobacconist, the town street vendor, and resident liar, Biscayne, and several other townspeople. Also in attendance are Tita and his family, consisting of his father, Aurelio, and his mother, Miranda, his maternal uncle, Lalo, and his grandfather. Tita is a young schoolboy who hangs out with his somewhat wild friends. Shortly after the bonfire, we see Tita and his friends, Giglio's... I'm going to screw these names. Giglio's... Giglio'sy? Giglio'sy. Whatever. Giglio'sy, Ovo, and Cicio, Cicio, attending school. The boys engage in hijinks in class while listening to boring lessons from their math teacher with a voluptuous chest, their biscuit-eating art teacher their oblivious religion instructor, and their tongue-clicking Italian teacher. Sissio fantasizes about Aldina, one of the girls in their class, while all the boys masturbate to dreams of both Aldina and Gradisca. Next, we see Tita eating dinner with his family. Aurelio becomes angry at Tita for his juvenile behavior with his friends, including Tita urinating on a neighbor's hat. Aurelio chases after Tita, who flees from the home. Despite his father's anger, Tita continues to hang out with his friends, lusting after the ever-present Gradisca. Sometime later, the town is visited by Mussolini's fa- fascist forces. Tita's uncle and most of the boys' teachers proudly display their loyalty to El Duce by wearing their uniforms during a town parade. Sissio daydreams about marrying Aldina in front of Mussolini's giant paper mache head. That night, fascist forces party in the town until someone begins playing a gramophone record of the anti-fascist song Internationale from the church tower. The fascists shoot the gramophone, destroying it. They begin to investigate who planted the gramophone in the tower. The investigation focuses in on Aurelio due to his anti-fascist beliefs. The fascists beat Aurelio and force him to drink castor oil, causing him to defecate himself. However, they allow him to live. Lalo is the person who turned Aurelio in. Next, the film shows a series of events centered around the Grand Hotel. Town liar Biscayne recounts a story of him having sex with 28 women from a visiting sultan's sultan's harem. Gradisca remembers a time when she is encouraged to sleep with a visiting fascist high official in return for government funds to rebuild the town's harbor. The hotel also serves as a base of operations for Lalo and his friends to seduce female tourists during the summer months while Tita and his friends look on from the bushes. Soon after, Tita and his family visit Tita's uncle, Tio, who lives at an insane asylum. The family takes Tio to the picnic in the country. However, Tio climbs a tall tree and begins screaming that he wants a woman. The family attempts to get him down from the tree, but Tio throws rocks at them, which prevents them from getting close. The family calls the hospital, who sends out a small nurse who somehow coerces Tio to come down. Tio says goodbye to his family as the nurse and staff take him back to the asylum. Next, the inhabitants of the town all embark on a sea voyage in small boats to see the SS Rex, a large Italian-made passenger ship that is passing near the town. 
Everyone floats on their boats in the ocean, waiting for the ship to appear. Near midnight, the ship finally appears after many of the citizens have fallen asleep. They cheer and weep as the ship passes in the night, overcome by the ship's majesty. Sometime later, Tita and his friends watch an annual car race as it drives through town. The boys dream, daydream about winning the race. Tita envisions himself capturing the, the attention of Gradiska, while Sissio fantasizes about not picking Aldina, having been spurned by her several times. Soon after, Tita goes to the tobacconist to get a cigarette. Although near closing, the pe- tobacconist allows the, the boy to attempt to pick her up. The tobacconist becomes sexually aroused while Tita becomes exhausted. She exposes her breasts and tells Tita to su- suckle on them. Already winded, Tita attempts to comply but soon struggles for, wear- for air. Unsatisfied, the tobacconist sends the bo- young boy away with a free cigarette. As winter descends, Tita falls ill and is tended to by his worried mother. Miranda gets a doctor to help her son, but it is real- revealed that she is ill as well. Soon after, the heavy snow falls on the town, burying it in several feet of snow. Tita visits his sick mother in the hospital, who tells him that he needs to grow up. After leaving the hospital, Tita pursues an unaware Gradiska through the maze of snowbanks. He engages in a snowball fight with his friends, his uncle Lalo, and Gradiska until a peacock mysteriously appears and captures everyone's attention with its beauty. A few days later, Tita wakes in his fam- home to learn that his mother has died. The young boy breaks down and cries in his mother's bedroom. After the funeral, he walks out of the church to find the puffballs have returned, drifting on the wind. A short time later, many of the townspeople attend Gradiska's marriage to an Italian officer. Tita is not in attendance, and one of the party goers states that the young boy has gone away. The film ends with Gradiska driving off with her new husband as the blind accordion player plays a tune. And that is Armacord. Well done. All right. It's, there's so much happening in this movie. Oh. You, you narrowed it down a little bit. Yeah, there, and that's just scratching the surface there. So, all right. Armacord was released on Italy, in Italy on December 18th, 1973. It was released in the United States on September 19th, 1974. I could not find any Australian information, Shane, so I apologize. <laughs> No, I looked as well. I know I got a re-release, but that would have been like an Italian or a Fellini film festival back in the day. But yeah, no official release I could find either. All right. The gross for this film, and this is what I found, and I can't believe this would be right, but grossed $192,000 worldwide. That's the gross I found for this film. 125 of that came from the United States, according to the information I have. So that may be woefully inaccurate, but that's that's the information from one of the sites I typically go through for as far as worldwide gross and U.S. gross. That um, sounds like it's inaccurate, unless the movie tickets were a dollar each or something. Right. All right. Uh, was winner of the best foreign language film in 1975. Uh, at the Academy Awards, but Fellini lost the Best Director Oscar to Milo's Foreman for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Best Writing Original Screenplay to Dog Day Afternoon in 1976. So explain that one to me, Shane. One Best Foreign Language Film in 1975, he loses it for the same film a year later in 1976. (laughs) That is a really good question. There's some kind of indiscretion there. Maybe... Maybe it didn't qualify. Um, maybe it qualified as a foreign film that first year, but then uh, qualified as a as a, another release or something the year after. I don't know. Yeah, that's the only thing I can think of as well. Looking at the release dates, it usually it was by December thirty first of seventy three. Yeah. So, if it was released in Italy in seventy three, it would have qualified for foreign film, but it wasn't released in the United States for se- until seventy four. But I thought once it was released, that's that's the first day of release is the year that you count. But who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. I think the U.S. have their own set of rules when it comes to movies. They have to be releasing a certain amount of cinemas in the U.S. to qualify, I think. Right. That's how it works. So, yeah. All right. Was the first film ever released in the letterbox f- format on video disc in 1984? It was in Roger Ebert's Great Movies list and included in the, the book, The Th- 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, and is one of Woody Allen's all-time favorite films. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 89% critics and 90% audience. So that is the information I have on Armacord. 
All right, Shane, you and I reviewed it for, we reviewed the Criterion disc, uh, you know, a few months ago. Now we're actually ta- here to talk about the film. In that podcast, we referenced the fact that both, neither one of us are Fellini fans. We're, you know, uh, n- anything specifically about Fellini you don't like or why you're not particularly a fan of his films? I find them, and again, I don't want to upset Fellini scholars out there, but I find them very hard to comprehend. Um, I've really only seen half a dozen of his films, including Juliet of the Spirits, Eight and a Half. I I really remember Roma and Satricon significantly because they were on the big screen back in the early 90s. I think I saw them as a re-release, you know, retro re-release, and I couldn't stand them. I I always heard Fellini being a movie fanatic and movie analyst growing up and and writing and seeing movies just my entire life, knowing that the respect that Federico Fellini has. I I don't know what it is, Patrick. And then watching Amacord, I struggled so much. I mean, there are certain aspects in this which we'll talk about that I did like, but they didn't outweigh what I didn't like. Um, His visuals are always stunning. I've found that, and the, the music is quite significant at times. He uses it to reflect certain scenes, as good directors do, but... I don't know. I mean, even Eight and a Half, which is considered a, a classic of his, um, and La Dolce Vita, which what I would say is probably my favourite that I've seen of his, but uh, again, I don't understand the fascination. Well, Shane, I'm not going to leave you out there on a limb. Much of what you just said about Fellini, I have the same opinions, that I struggled to comprehend what he's trying to tell me with his films. And, right. and and that frustrates me is that without a doubt, he's a skilled director. What I struggle with is what what is this film supposed to say to me at the end of the day? You know, what am I supposed to when I walk out of the theater or I turn off the the DVD? What's supposed to le- stay with me from this film? And in a lot his a lot of his films, I I. I don't. I'm, I'm sitting there just flabbergasted with. I don't know what I'm. I'm supposed to take from that. Exactly. And so I agree with you absolutely. That and that's why I too am not what I would describe as a Fellini fan. Is I I, I understand he, there's a lot of people that have a lot of reference or reverence towards him, and obviously he was a very very skilled director. People love to work with him, and he definitely has a style. I mean, there's a, a especially with Armacord. I think Armacord is probably the most cartoonish, if you will, of his films based off my impression, although I think in a lot of his films is that the characters are literally characters. I mean, they're they're almost cartoonish in nature depending on the film, but very much so in Armacord compared to a lot of his other films. Yeah, and I understand that it's based on actual events of his childhood and 1930s, so things are different, and he would have seen it from from memories, you know, re, recreated his memories, uh, and it's a personal project for him, but you're right, it was all over the place, and that's what I said after you talked about, you did your summary, you did well to uh, condense it, because there's so much happening here, and I, I really lost concentration as much as I was trying to follow characters and and what their movements were and, and the motivation. I just lost interest more often than once. Now, specifically about Armacord, and you've mentioned that, that my summary trying to capture the essence of what this film is, and, and, I, and I fail miserably. My summary does not capture the entirety of this film by any st- stretch of it. I tended in my summary, the way when I watched it is to focus on Tita. I mean, he seems to be the primary character that everything else, there's a lot of action that goes out, that occurs outside of his viewpoint as well, but he seems to be the character that, uh, for a lack of a better term, Back, better term is supposed to be the character that the audience is supposed to follow because he, he is having these adventures and these are the things that are happening to him and he seems to have the arc where you know he's a young boy a young immature boy at the beginning of the film and after his mother's death actually yeah. leaves the town and essentially what I would presume is to become his own person to become his own man um, and that's the best description I can I, I could have for kind of an underlying story for this. W- would you agree with that, or did you take away something completely different than what I took away from this? No, I think you're right. No, that's that's pretty much what I was thinking as well. And and some of those emotional moments did come through, uh, but that is the basis of. There's a lot going on around him, but 
that was the basis I thought to just following his journey. I I have a question I want to ask you, but I want to ask you towards the end. So let's talk about like the visuals, the cinematography in this. What did you think of the cinematography in this film, Shane? Yeah, most of it was lovely. The natural locations, uh, the snow scene with the peacock is outstanding. I really enjoyed that. I'm guessing it was real snow. It was hard to tell. I was trying to see if it was. At one point, the camera panned up to the sky and it looked like blue sky. So I'm not sure what was going on there. Uh, And the car racing was interesting. That was quite well done because that would have been a real guys driving the cars around those skinny streets, dusty streets. So that was that was fun. Um, Yeah, no, I really like the cinematography, actually. It's only watched it on DVD, but the restoration was good enough for me to enjoy it, considering it's such an old movie. Yeah. I, you know that that was something visually. It's very much to me like almost a cart, a comic book, a cartoon. There's so many colors. The, there's so much going on, both in the foreground as well as the background, almost all the time. And it, it's a very very busy film. It's it's very hard to take in everything all at once as you're watching it because, uh, especially in, in, in like the bonfire sequence, as you kind of said, the uh, yeah the, the snow sequence. Anything that involved crowds, even the, when they're going out to the wrecks, there's so much in the background and the foreground that there's it's just so busy. And I, I just imagine the kind of the complicated nature of making keeping that all straight and making sure that you have all kind of these story threads feeding into each other and having not having any continuity problems constantly as you're making it. It, it just really really was very impressive and uh, the town itself becomes so much of a character in the film is that you know that that is the central point the point is just the people of this town even though they're they're in existence but the town itself is the kind of the center point of one of the stories of uh, you know ultimately uh, tita leaves the town and that is the end of the film yeah, I would assume that that town was either a real town or, or made up around a real town because they look like authentic old buildings. I don't know if it was a film set. It could have been, but it was recreated extremely well. Uh, and to give you the opposite end of the spectrum of what you just said about crowds, what about when they're at the farm where there was no crowds? That was really good cinematography. And at one point when he was up the tree, you were seeing his view – looking down and then the camera wouldn't be close to the tree to be way back and you'd see him in the tree yeah so stuff like that the isolation of the the farm area i thought was pretty good too all right uh, any character <laughs> this is a tough one for you any character that you really liked in the film you thought was fascinating no <laughs> I, I thought lady, the lady with the big bosoms at the end, the tobacconist, was really going to have a bit more to do. But no, even that ended quite abruptly. No, I could. I really tried, Patrick, but I, I, I didn't associate with any of these characters. And even though I don't, don't associate with certain characters, I'll still like or follow their journeys. It was tough. Uh, no, I, I couldn't say that I actually liked anyone that's you know, more than the other here. What about the music in the film? You said that he used music to enhance some of the scenes. Did you think he did it effectively? Less music than some of the other Fellini films that I recall. However, uh, the one particular sequence with the woman in red as she pops into the bed. No, it's the prince, isn't it, that walks in with a big smile on his face? It's a, it's, it's a fat – one of the members yeah. of the fascist party. Yeah, that was all interesting because they looked like they were moving in slow motion and, and it was oh, it's just just different and I did like that music there. But, no, I I thought it was nice. I thought it was good good soundtrack, just not a lot of it compared to some of the other films like La Dolce Vita, yeah, for he, instance. Yeah, he did use music a lot more sparingly in this film than I would have expected because there's a lot – I mean, there when he does use it – it's being done for a purpose. That scene you mentioned, also the harem scene, uh, specifically, oh, yeah. was uh, you know heavily mus- musically driven, uh, and even music with concerning the the boat wrecks where they're all out of the ocean, you know, waving goodbye to it. That there's a lot of music driven behind that. Which, by the way, the uh, boat eventually got sunk as part of World War Two. So uh, that was a real <laughs> boat, and it did get sunk. All right. 
I'm struggling, Shane. What else do we want to talk about with this film? I know I have a point I want to ask you to see if it changes your perspective, because this is how after I thought, sat and thought about it, what it, and it changed my perspective and when I thought about how I thought about this film. But before I get to that, anything else you want to talk about with this film? Well, you know, like a lot of films, if you if I decided to watch it again someday, I might have a different point of view. And I'm, I'm open to that, just not immediately, because I tr- struggled too much for me to go through this. And I did not find it very funny. I mean, comedy is a is a subjective, personal thing, and it does. I have be the first to admit a, a good comedy is hard to find in my eyes because not a lot does make me laugh out loud. Uh, but I do smirk, and I do um, I, I really appreciate good comedy, but this stuff was just like cartoonish and not working for me. So I wouldn't say I'm going to absolutely disown and forget this film, but it didn't impress me. Um, I'm trying to be as kind as I possibly can. (laughs) All right. Well, I I will drop my bomb on you. This is, I watched. Yes, I'm interested in this. Okay. I, I watched this film. And because I watched it on the Criterion, I had to watch it two times in a row. So I watched the film, and then I watched the the critics. And I will I tell you, sorry, the film professors talking about the two of them off the on the Criterion disc. And this was not something they said; it was just something that occurred to me as I was watching this. And you know, this is a film about his his memories, his reminiscence of his childhood and how he grew up, and the kind of the misadventures of not only just him and his friends, but some of the people in the town. And and I and I'm uh, once again I'm kind of going, what am I supposed to take from this? Same as I do with any other Fellini film. And it suddenly occurred to me when I was watching it the second time, what do I take from Dazed and Confused? Dazed and Confused. It's a, a film, essentially, of a, a series of reminiscence of the life of those people over one, basically one day, from one day to That's the next true. morning. That is true, that, yes. At, at the end of the day, I, there's a, s- a certain amount of evolution to one character who he's standing up for what he believes in, and he's going to li- live his life, but it's just a series of misadventures of a bunch of high school kids, you know, and some of the various people in the town that come in interaction with those high school, high school kids, and... It's just told in the 70s perspective, not 1930s uh, fascist Italy perspective. And, and or even going to something like Clerks by Kevin Smith is just the day in the life of these two clerks. There's not really much as far as evolution of the characters or story. It's just the day in the life. This is a year in the life of those. And suddenly when I started thinking of it as I'm watching it the second time that I went, I'm not supposed to take anything other than, other than this is just a perspective of this is just what happened and that I'm not, there's no grand meaning to it. It's just, this is, you know, just high school pranks, high school uh, interactions and thinking of it in the terms of like dazed and confused or clerks or films such as that, where there's no grand meaning to it. There's, you know, there's some subtle evolution. And in this film, you have a, some subtle evolution of, especially of the Tita characters. He kind of grows up and chooses to leave the town to, to fulfill that, that goal, or at least we're presumed to think that that is what it is about. That is the grand meaning of this is just, these are the things that happened during my, Tita's life or these characters' lives. And suddenly I had a better appreciation of the film because I love Days and Confused. I think it's a great film. I really like watching that film. I find it entertaining. Probably can relate to it better because I at least remember the 70s. I wasn't quite teenagers in the 70s, but I remember the 70s and I definitely remember high school in the 80s and it wasn't that far removed so I can relate to Days and Confused. I think the struggle possibly you and I have is we can't relate to these characters in 1930s Italy. (laughs) Yeah, possibly. I mean, you know, there are movies that are set in the 30s. I can't name them off the top of my head, but there's ones that I've enjoyed more than this. But you're right. I mean, things... I'm listening to what you're saying about comparing it to Days and Confused, and and I, I get where you're coming from. So you're right. There are different generations and different things that happen... And we either relate or we don't relate or we're open to a whole new world. And, I mean, Fellini had his moments, obviously, and, that you know, that it gets better, this film, as it goes, I've got to say. The opening bonfire moments and then I'm like, well, here we go. I'm not going to really enjoy this. But it got better as time went, in a sense, and especially at the end when the that was quite sad 
when the mother died. So it obviously it grabbed my attention enough for me to feel emotional during the finale in the last ten minutes or so. So, it, it, but it, that's a good comparison. Yeah, and and that's not even to say that this is just a, the basically a you know teen comedy set in 1930s Italy. That's not it at all. There is a tremendous amount of symbolism in this, and I'm horrible at identifying those things. And Shane's also Stop. previously said so that he's horrible. You know, having Chris or Bobby here would have been really helpful because they're really good at finding the Christ figure and all the and everything that's going on. But you know, without a doubt, the peacock showing up in the middle of winter in the middle of all that snow is symbolic of something. I don't know what I'm supposed to take from that. Even the reaction of all the characters seems to speak, this is important. But as I sit there and stare at it, I go, I don't know why it's important. <laughs> I just know Well, it that. stopped everyone, like the characters, it stopped all them in their tracks. Right. So it was definitely meant to signify something and uh, must have ironically gone over my head. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, it went over mine too, is I'm going, this is significant and I can't tell you why it is other than, I can tell by the way it's being framed or by the reaction of all the characters it, that is absolutely significant to this to the story or at least some sort of symbolism but you know as I said everybody in the in the book in the sorry not in the book in the movie is somewhat cartoonish especially the fascist characters I mean they're played off as absolutely buffoonish pretty much most of the time the teachers and the uncle and how they interact with people the only time that they're truly sinister is when they're somewhat torching our Aurelio by beating him and making him drink the castor oil because they think he put the gramophone up there to embarrass them um but throughout the rest of it is you know obviously fellini was not fond of the the um mussolini's forces and the fascist no no that was pretty obvious wasn't it yeah and goes out of the way to portray, portray the teachers who support that regime as kind of buffoonish and cartoonish and you know including running through the smoke the entire time or having their picture taken and even mussolini's paper mache head with flowers on it talking and uh, marrying that kid in his daydream is um, is supposed to be kind of you know showing the kind of the cartoonish nature of, of fascism during that time frame so i understand that but in, it was those kind of moments that i was bewildered by yeah but once again it possibly doesn't speak to us because we don't relate to 1930s True. italy yep. you know and th- th- that's not something i mean we understand it from an uh, intellectual point of view but it doesn't speak to us as as far as our movie watching because i agree with you that uh, the the most poignant moments are Tita and his mother Miranda as you know she's as she's getting sick and dying and telling him it's time for him to grow up and time for him essentially to be become a man and that finally resonates with him you know shortly thereafter and he he leaves you know and, and we we're not even given the satisfaction of seeing him really leave it's just he's gone that's how it's described he's gone yeah yeah no you're right there I I get. I have that feeling that I probably missed a whole bunch of things that signify plot points as well as the arcs of what he was trying to symbolize. Oh, oh well. Wow. I, I, I'm right there with you, Shane. So, but all right. <laughs> let, well, let's wrap this one up. Let's uh, how, how many uh, paper mache Mussolini's would you give this one out of five? <laughs> and, and also in relation to your other Fellini films, do you like this this one about the same, less, or more? Less. Uh, I still think that probably eight and a half or La Dolce Vita deserves the um, popularity that they have, although uh, they're only just above this one and the others I've seen, although I think Satricon is probably my least favourite. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, um, Patrick. I just think that... Um, I will never. I will not give up on Federico Fellini films, but uh, this one hasn't gained any more interest for me. And out of five, look, I, I think that personally, I'm going to give it two out of five. Okay. I can hear the groaning from the Fellini crowd out there. <laughs> but if I was much more into what he was trying to say, maybe and and maybe taking a little bit more notice of it and not drifting off. Um, I didn't stop it or pause it or leave the room or anything. I just was, like I mentioned earlier, struggled to to comprehend anything these these characters were doing basically 90% of the time. So, um, yeah, if I was more of a fan, I'd probably double that and give it four. But personally, I'm giving it two out of five. 
All right. Well, I will say that I like this more than most Fellini, uh, Fellini films that I've seen. I am not, as, as I said, I'm not a big fan of Fellini films. La Dolce Vita is probably my favorite other than this one. I would say I like this one better. Now, I also say I saw a large the Fellini films I had seen, including this one. Mm-hmm. I seen these in the yeah. early 90s and really wasn't enjoying them. And I think I saw eight and a half. I don't think I've ever seen Satricon. Um, in fact, I know I haven't seen Satricon. I've seen La Dosa Vida and I've seen Armacord. Oh, God, I'm missing one other. God, I know there's another one I've seen, but didn't care for anyone, any one of them specifically. Um, so, but this would be my second and third time seeing Armacord uh, uh, with watching the Criterion. I like this one more, and I liked it much more after I kind of shifted my perspective a little bit to think, okay, all right, now, now that I'm not expecting too much of this film and just enjoying it for watching the kind of the hijinks of these characters, these cartoon characters that I think are pretty portrayed pretty well for entertainment perspective. I, you know, I like it a little bit better that I'm not trying to, uh, to find this deeper meaning. I think there are deeper meanings with symbolism in it, but I don't think it's, it's, it's the driving force behind it. It's just supposed to be, this was my life type of uh, this viewpoint. And because of that, I liked it more. Now, that being said, it's not, I am, I don't sit there and say it's an absolute classic film. Uh, I would give it three and a half, you know, it's, I enjoyed it more. I didn't enjoy it absolutely the top 100 films of all time. You know, not anywhere near that. I I liked it a little bit more. I'd be very interested now knowing um, kind of this shifting perspective on this Fellini film. If I went back and started rewatching some of the other ones, if it changed my perspective on the other ones. That being said, I'm not rushing out to go watch those. <laughs> but. No, I've always had this fascination of um, watching City of Women, a movie he made in the early 80s, I think, from memory, and Casanova. I mean, I've never really liked any Casanova movies I've seen, but he did do his version of that. So they'd be two that I would consider checking out, but I won't rush. (laughs) And I want to mention, too, that Fellini is a really significant name in the movie industry, obviously, classic cinema and so forth. However, there's a new actress. She's only young. She's a teenager. Who um, Her name is Angelica Bett Fellini, and she caught my attention in a Netflix series that she's in. Um, and I just thought I'd mention that because it is a rare, very rare um, name. And she, that's her name, it's Angelica she- Bett Fellini. But I don't think she's – not that I can tell she's related or there's any distant relations to Frederico. There might be, but – I haven't found any information on that. Um, The French Dispatch is what she's coming up in, the new Wes Anderson film, and um, I've seen a few episodes of a television show called Teenage Bounty Hunters. But it's significant to mention her because of the name. All right. Well, now I have to go find out if she's related to Fellini, just because I'll probably end up seeing French Dispatch for, for no other better reason, but... Oh, I love Wes Anderson, and you know he ha- always has a galaxy of stars in his films. They're always so quirky. But I think with that kind of name, she hasn't changed it, so I'm sure she might have some kind of diff- distant relation uh, connection to Frederico. Who knows? If not, it might be just a coincidence. All right. Well, that does it for this month's review of Armacord. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Pinterest or Twitter at MH Memories. On any one of those social media outlets, you can keep informed about our occasional written film reviews and film summaries, news and upcoming theatrical releases and trailers, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network. And if you've enjoyed it yourselves and you download us off either iTunes, Android, Google Play, Stitcher, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or any other streaming service, make sure to rate our podcast on your chosen platform. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Additionally, you can now subscribe to our accounts on YouTube, where, we're, where we are releasing our podcast day and date with their release on most podcast platforms. On YouTube, you can give us a like or a dislike, leave a comment, or, or even subscribe to the account so you can get updates from YouTube, YouTube whenever we release a new episode. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Concessions. Until next time, I'm Patrick. And I'm Shane A. And that feedback we're going to get on this one will be very interesting, <laughs> Patrick. 
I don't know if we'll get much feedback on this. I, I, I've yet to ever meet a person who's truly a huge Fellini fan. But <laughs> now that I've said that, we'll probably get a lot. So, all right. And this concession stand is closed. podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The song Rock On Bretta is brought to you by Marwan Nimra at Nintentine.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Movie House Concessions, the MHN Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment LLC unless otherwise noted. 